you know, the, the, the angel one, and I sat in the back row in the end seat. Anybody ever do that? Where's my good Lutheran buddies in here? I mean, I'm a, some of you know I'm a lay pastor to Lutheran, or lay preacher to Lutheran church. Yeah, Lutherans always go to church early so they can sit in the back pew on the end, just in case, you know. So I sit in my chair, the speaker's getting ready to go, and I, I had even checked the door to see if it creaks. You know, because if you leave early and the door creaks, everybody turns around. Door was cool. Angel and the devil are getting along. I'm, I'm maybe in the shade, right? Maybe I'll hang out 15, 20 minutes, take a few notes, and then bang, I'm out of it. So I'm sitting there in a the chair, right, at the college coaches convention. I'm, I'm coaching a Macintosh, and out of nowhere, the guy starts talking. I'm, I'm, I'm golden, right? Immediately, I get this cap on my shoulder. He says, hey, can you move down four or five seats? Well, I move down four or five seats, like blows my whole rap, right? I mean, I can't, I can't leave. And I look up, and I'm trying to think of some good excuse to say, and it's Coach Petromala, Bill Tierney, and Richie Mead. So now I'm like, <laughs> so I move down three or four seats, you know, and I'm kind of pissed off. And as I'm sitting there, I'm amazed. You know, Petromala wearing a coat and tie, loose in his hair, looking good, um, takes about 20 pages of notes. And this guy that's speaking doesn't have anywhere near the pedigree that Petro has, right? And I started to feel really guilty and melancholy because I was thinking, man, if Petromala thinks he has something to learn, who am I to think I should be in my room resting up? And I challenge coaches with this all the time. You know, this is kind of like, I told Coach Kyle, Hannon, this is like Jesus coming back to Nazareth. I've never done a speaking gig in Atlanta. It's kind of strange. Anyway, we tell our players to get on the wall, lift weights, right, all the time. Get on the wall, lift weights, off-season conditioning. But yet coaches, maybe one weekend a year, if they go to U.S. across Ryan LCA, that's when they want to get better. It's just hypocritical, man. You know, you want to have a great team, you got to be better every year, and coaches get better every year. We're CK. Stand up, man. <laughs> so I had this, I had this crazy idea. You know, in real life, I, I research Gen X and Gen Y, and I write books. And I had this idea to emulate IMLCA on the internet. Okay. And I wasn't not a very good speaker, not a very good author, <laughs> so I didn't have a lot of money. You know, CK is like just. Not only see the bomb as a coach, not only see the bomb as a Christian, not only see the bomb as a man, you know, but he's a great publisher. And I took my idea to him and I said, here's what I want to do. And he goes, hey man, man, we played together for a couple years in college. He goes, let me give you a little bit of money. I want to help out. Let's get in this thing together. And I still haven't paid it back. But, um, and just going to kill you. Yeah, well, yeah, good luck. Um, so anyway, we thought we would emulate this on the internet. And the idea was to interview NCAA coaches on practice plans and ideas and try and give 4,000 varsity programs in North America and Canada access to practice plans. So we never talk about how you're going to beat Hopkins. We never talk about your recruiting class. All we talk about is practice plans. And I kind of had this, this dream, you know, that maybe we could help coaches. Well, four years later, we've got 4,000 member coaches of our website. Uh, we've got 90 plus hours of podcasts. Uh, every month we interview two NCAA coaches. You can listen to them describe the drill in their own words, as well as write an article or read an article. You know, I just put a new article up on Latch Power. Um, but I want you to understand one thing before I get into this. this none of this is my stuff. I'm actually not that good a coach, okay? Um, but at the end of the day, coaches are so willing to share and now I get to share some of that information with you. I want to start with a couple of quotes here that I think are going to blow you away. In the four years we've been doing this project, we've heard some amazing things, you know, from legends. You know, we've interviewed Sarja uh, twice, um, and in the first interview I asked him, he started talking about, like, the press getting on his case, you know, and, and asking him when he was going to retire. And I said, Coach, I mean, a lot of stuff you hear about Dom Starja, pro and con, right? And, the, and his players' conduct and stuff like this. Everybody knows that he adopted two special needs kids, right? I mean, it's a loving human being here. I mean, don't believe everything you see in the press or the sideline. Anyway, so I said, Coach, you sound like that bothers you. He goes, it does bother me. I said, well, why would something like that bother you? He says, man, I'm not sure I'll have a chance to change everything I need to change. Can you imagine Starja saying that? 
So I'm interviewing Bill Tierney. Actually, right after he wrote even the last year he was at Princeton. And he said that after 35 years of coaching, six NCAA championship D1 appearances, he had to totally change the way he coaches practice. I'm going, seriously? Six NCAA championships? Now you're, now you're going to change? I mean, these are the guys that guys like us watch on TV and look up to, right? I mean, it's amazing. Why would you have to change? We're all trying to be like you. And he said the players today are different. The old style of coaching doesn't work. The game itself is different. You know, it used to be anybody in here over 50? Guys that have been in lacrosse, anybody over 55? Do I hear 55 feel high? I'm older than you? That sucks, man. Are we the oldest guys here? I mean, Billy will tell you, you know, in the old days, we would put a feeder behind and run a bunch of cutters down off of picks, right? And presumably the fat kid that was playing pole covering the feeder couldn't stay with him and we would score. Well, now the fat guys are gone. They're in coaching. You see what I'm talking about? So that which you got is guys that are tremendously athletic poles behind, and any coach in the country will tell you the day of the pure feeder is not gone, but the day of the pure feeder is there's only four or five in the country. And you got 50 or 60 pretty competitive D1 teams. Anyway, so after doing normally 90 hours on the air and probably another 80 or 90 hours off the air, this is where we're at. This is what we've learned. And I also want to share with you some of the differences, including some of the things that Kyle and his staff said, you know, that you hear other coaches talk about that as well as maybe going a little bit different. Kids today are different. The game is different. Offenses are driven from top side now, not behind, okay? Because there's no more fat kids. So, kids today are different. I wrote an article for Last Power, their lawyer changed it. You know, I put uh, drills for ADD lacrosse players. <laughs> You're not allowed to say ADD lacrosse players, you know? But if you were allowed to say ADD lacrosse players, how long is the attention span of the kids today? Six to seven minutes, seven to eight minutes. Frankly speaking, and, and I've spent a lot of time with Kyle Hannon, obviously we've developed this friendship. I got to know him when he was still at Goucher. And uh, you know, the Copperheads, we used to play the Baltimore Crabs up there all the time at Goucher. Anyway, most coaches never run a drill more than seven to eight minutes. When you see 15, that means that they're running it both ways. 15 is the absolute max that you'll see a college coach run a drill. But yet, when I go to high school practices or rec practices, I see the same process, right? First, we run laps. Who runs laps? Go ahead, put up your hand. I'm going to hammer the crap out of you in just a second, right? <laughs> First, we run laps, right? And we do line drills. Who's doing line drills? That's another brilliant idea from the 1800s, OK? And then we run six on six for 30 or 40 minutes. Who's with me? Amen. That ship has sailed. You won't find a college program in the country that runs practices that way. And, and what I want to share with you and what we've shared with 4,000 coaches is that you can run a JV team or a U15 team with the exact same practice you run an NCAA D1 team. You just got to have a ton of balls and you've got to focus on pace. And I'm going to show you how important that is. Number one, so you've got to shorten the span of your drills because your kids have a short attention span. You can sit there and scream at them I mean, where's my old timers? Billy, you remember we used to run fast breaks? And we'd say, until we score five times, we're still going to be here. I remember one night, it was like 10.30. We had the lights on for the cars, right? <coughs> it's not there, let it go. Come back to it another day. Number two, you ought to be able to take every drill in your practice plan and run it through this filter and see how you do. Number two, every single drill needs to directly emulate the game scenario. Kids today question authority figures all the time. And, and old timers like us, we think it's insubordination. What I would submit to you for my Gen X and Gen Y research is not insubordination at all. Every time a kid turns on the TV, you see some kind of authority figure, maybe even a religious icon, right, being questioned by the media. I mean, people question our president. People question our pastors. People question congressmen. How often can you open up the newspaper and not see improprieties of some kind of authority figure that's being questioned? 
So kids today, when they grow up, they grow up seeing authority questioned in the media. To a 15 or an 18 year old asking you, don't you hate that coach? Yes, I do. Man, we know each other. We're from. It's <laughs> cool. Brian. Brian Miller. Yeah, you're at uh, Brookwood. What? Brookwood. Brookwood area. Um, how many of you have said, I want you guys to go do this, and the kids look at you with that look? Who gets that look? Well, the more brazen ones, you can say what? No, no, well, that's really brazen. Yeah, they wouldn't play for me long. Uh, yeah, yeah, they say why, right? And the coach says, because I'm the coach and I've been doing this 35 years, you do what I say, shut up, right? You've lost the trust of your team. It doesn't work anymore. You know, you can try and beat them into your way of coaching. But if Petromal has changed, and you know, I mean, I could tell you some stories. Anyway, so kids need to understand how every drill helps them prepare for a game. So that's the reason I don't do line drills. You know, the only reason you see an NCAA team doing line drills, there's only two or three coaches left, you know, that do line drills, is generally in the pregame just that they don't have the field to warm the goal in. Every drill needs to emulate a game scenario. Next one. Kyle talked about progression, or uh, we want to talk about progression. Practicing in transition, and we're going to talk a lot about that. When we started this project three or four years ago, all colleges would practice 3v2, build to 4v3, build to 5v4, build to 6v5. And when you're coaching JV or youth, maybe that's a good way, and, and it still has some merit. Kind of interesting, every year we see changes in the college coaching mentality on the website. In the last year and a half, we've seen coaches really vary, instead of going 3v2, 4v3, go 5v4, then go 2v1, go 3v2, because in a game, you know, you don't have a chance to like build up and work into what you're trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? Um, next, focus on touches. I mean, one of the biggest like gorilla personalities you see on television is Petromala. I wish I could tell, have time to tell you some of the stories about how he has said that, how he had to change. You know, and even the practices at Hopkins need to be fast and fun. Keyword fun. Because the kids learn if they're having fun. And that's another reason we stay in transition. So let me cover some of these pretty quickly. You know, when I first, the cards, when I first started coaching at Macintosh, I thought practice plans were for guys that never played. Anybody here have that same philosophy? Man, what a dummy I was. Practice planning is the most important part of being a coach. Far and away. Because if the kids are ADD, and I say that respectfully, they also multitask, which is a huge advantage in coaching, you know, compared to the early days. Um, but you gotta plan your practices. Every coach I know, you know, and Kyle, I'm not sure he was, he, he shows you the top of the elephant, but you know, not the good side. I mean, every coach, we plan them down to the minute, right? But then on our practices, we also track touches. And this is something that I got mostly from Berkman, and then you hear paces and touches, paces and touches all the time from the NCAA coaches. So in our practices, and a lot of coaches, you know, that are come from the same mantra, we have to get every player 200 touches in the first hour of practice. Non-negotiable. Poles, goalies, everybody. 200 touches and then 300 touches in a practice, okay? Now, you know, like I said, I really don't want to talk about me, but I'll tell you this, you know, we had a team at McIntosh go from zero to state championship game, double OT against Lovett. Some of you are probably there. Better coach, we'd have won. <coughs> Not a single All-State guy on that team. At Auburn last year, we had the Southeast Player of the Year, not one guy all conference. But if you talk to people about our teams, they got 25 guys that can bang the ball, man, and they play together. Anyway, so if you notice here, 200 touches for high school and even at Auburn, a lot of times we do this with shooting drills to accomplish touches. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have Coach Jaden and the other assistant coach coaching with you every day at your, at your high school, your rec room. But unfortunately, most high school guys, no offense, 
you have what we affectionately refer to as one and a half coaches, right? I don't want to make anybody mad. But you got like a guy that understands a little bit about lacrosse, and then you got the guy that coached basketball, and he's a social studies teacher. No offense, social studies teachers, okay? That's why guys like Busick and, and Tony, and I mean, that's why some of these schools are always so good. You know, they got, they got great players in these coaches, you know? The exception to that would be Hunter, of course. Anyway, so we use shooting drills instead of line drills and four touches, and I'm going to show you. Um, and the other thing is, it always ends in a shot. <clears throat> So if you notice, it's right hand, left hand, roll dodge, split dodge, all the fundamentals, multitasking, but this is kind of the way we do it. And before we get into that, you know, some of you still feel the need to run laps. Um, I've been to probably six or seven Mercer practices. I've probably been to 40 NCAA practices. You know, they expect those guys to be ready to go when they come out. We're, we're immediately going 2v1, 3v2, 4v3, get the blood up, establish the pace of practice, and the way the mood's going to be for the next next hour and a half. But yet coaches still want to run laps. See, when they run laps, that's a good chance for you to talk about lunch that day, isn't it? It's so stupid. I mean, when you can do the same thing differently. Now, here's a group out of Chicago. Uh, these are some clinics I've done. Every film I'm going to show you, uh, I knew that Kyle had some college film, so I picked all my U15 and JV type players, there's a couple copperhead clips. Uh, but again, here, rather than run, run laps, we're passing middle to the outside, outside to the middle, middle to the outside, outside to the middle, down and back seven or eight times. If you feel like you've got to run laps, maybe this will help your fix. Now notice, nobody's running behind anybody here. This is not a three-man weave. How many guys run three-man weaves? Oh, now nobody's going to agree to anything. <laughs> yeah, but a three-man weave doesn't emulate your offense, right? This isn't basketball. But yet, when you clear it, you want that guy looking right and left, okay? And at the end of every line, if they change lines, now we're forcing them to be outside shoulder, right hand, left hand, so on and so forth. Um, this one is kind of interesting. Uh, I call this the, uh, the new wave line drill. Uh, this is great for rep programs. If you still feel compelled to run some type of line drill, uh, this is called a circle drill. These two players here are just running around in a circle. These two players are just running around in a circle. When he comes to the apex of the circle, he's going to catch it right, throw it right. Then he's just going to run around the circle. This player's going to come up, catch right, throw right. And the beautiful thing here is that every throw and catch is on the run. See, a lot of times, I mean, if you're a great high school coach, and I'm going to tell you, in this room, there's some phenomenal high school coaches, OK? And, and you're going to hear from Don next. I mean, guy's an incredible coach, OK? But at the end of the day, if you're a good high school coach, even sometimes for your rec program, you get kids that are U15 that are really good flat-footed, right? What if we could start to integrate always moving through the catch and moving through a pass, similar to the outfield, outfield uh, move that, that Coach Hannon introduced last year? I never figured that out either. Anyway, so watch here, if you will. direction of the circle to clockwise we're going to catch left throw left and we're going to catch left split and throw right if you got an uneven amount of players just add a third guy to the circle as, as you can see they did here now this is an old copperhead team this X team actually won the national championship um, but and they're kind of goofing around because they want to make me look bad but in the time that you would do line drills even if you're a progressive coach and only have four guys in a line in seven minutes, you get 35 or 40 touches. In six or seven minutes doing this drill, you get 70 or 80 touches. And again, I'm not saying to do these drills. What I am saying is start to run your drills through a filter, okay, of uh, how many touches. And are we focusing on the fundamentals of moving through the catch, hands up high, catching behind our head, 
throwing when we're stepping. And I mean, it takes the same amount of time to teach players to throw and catch on the run as it does to throw and catch standing still and then, then change it. Um, I don't know, a lot of people think I'm crazy. Uh, a lot of people in this room. But this, this technique has worked for me for a long time. Uh, we use shooting instead of our traditional line throws. Now, you know, teams like Syracuse are famous for their star breakout passing girl, so on and so forth. And that's all good stuff. But I'm not sure it emulates the game situation. And, and I'm not suggesting that I'm a better coach than anybody at Syracuse. But these techniques have worked good for us. As an example of what I'm talking about, we're trying to keep every player moving. We're trying to get right hand touches, left hand touches, multi-task, throw a dodge in. So this first clip I have for you here is actually Salisbury. And I want you to notice, this is just a simple four-man shooting drill. But I, I go to pre-games when I go watch GSSA games and I see, you know, these fancy stars, guys coming in and out. You know, the thing here is, just like Coach Hannon said, you want the drill to emulate your game. So here we're going to throw a pass. It's going to be what I call low to high. But notice here, it's got to be a right-hand pass. It's got to be a left-hand catch. Then he's going to go shoot. Over here, it's got to be a left-hand pass to a right-hand catch. But notice these players are not just catching and shooting. They have to do some kind of dodge. It could be a split. It could be a roll. It could be a hitch. You know, it could be anything. And here you see Salisbury running this. Uh, if we were to run this drill for six minutes with a 25-man high school roster, can you imagine the touches we would get right and left? And how much fun is it for the kids? See, they think it's a shooting drill. It's not a shooting drill at all. <laughs> it's right hand left. It just happens to end in a shot to try and make it fun. So, one of the reasons I didn't put a lot of the college film in is because you're sitting there and I'm not sure that applies to my roster. This next group I want to show you is doing the same drill, only they're going it the other way. Here we're going to throw high to low. We're going to come up here, remember multitask, we're going to inside roll. So in the next drill, it's left-handed pass, right-handed catch, right-handed cradle into a left-handed inside roll and shot. On the other side, it's going to be a right-handed pass. Remember, outside shoulder, we want to coach. Left-handed catch, he's going to drive up here with a left-handed cradle, inside roll, and shoot it right-handed. But this next clip you're going to see is only 10 kids, and they're all 14 years old. And I want you to see how they do the same drill, only the other way. We're forcing them to use both hands. The drills happen so fast that nobody knows if Johnny caught it or didn't catch it, right? Here's a right hand pass, it's a left hand catch, we're going to practice left hand cradle, we're going to roll. You know, when people come to practice, they're going, why would you have the goalies in the shooting drills, man? Well, how many guys coach by themselves occasionally here? What are you going to do with the goalie? Oh, I know, go throw long passes. Isn't that what they always said, Rick? You, you, you three guys here that I don't know what to do with, you go throw long passes, okay? And let me know when you get back. So even our goals, you know, every bowl has got to be able to have the ability to roll back in a big question mark before they redirect the ball. We're working on that skill, but if you watch your bowls work on that in practice, you know, that might get seven or eight touches in ten minutes. Here we're getting a boatload of touches short. In my mind, this drill is only, it's like jumping jacks. I don't care if they catch it or not. As long as they got the stick here, we're working on the fundamentals, moving through the ball, throwing up high. All we're doing here is establishing touches. Remember, we want 200 touches in the first hour. Um, this next one, I, I'm sorry, man. This is a four-hour coaching clinic that I boiled down to 40 minutes. So, um, so some of this may seem scattered to you. The next key point here, kids always want to know why. With a little creativity, you can take any drill that you've run historically or any drill you want to run and make it emulate, truly emulate, a snapshot of a game. Whatever drills you're doing, make it a snapshot, okay? Is every drill game realistic? Are your shooting drills your offense? Or are they some fancy shooting and passing drill you came up with? Uh, you know, I was really blessed four or five years ago. We had a cocktail head team win the uh, U-17 Dicks National Championship. Most of those guys are playing for Kyle now. 
And I was being interviewed by Inside the Cross after the game, you know, and the team was all euphoric behind me. Imagine that, a team from Georgia winning a North American Travel Team Championship. And we win such good players. Anyway, the guys go, hey, coach, I've never seen a team move the ball like that. Your team moves the ball so well. How often do you practice? I said, like, two or three times before a tournament. He goes, how do you run all those plays? And the kids are laughing their tails off behind me, right? We don't run plays. We run our shooting drills and our drills in the game. Let me give you a couple of examples. Now, how many of you want to get the ball from the strong side to the weak side, right? And in Kyle's offense, they bang it across the top. So here, let's pretend this is a strong side. We're going to key in, key out, free our hands for a pass. Again, left-handed pass, right-handed catch. Immediately, he's going to bang it across to this guy who's going to come in and shoot. You might call this a, if you want to redirect your offense from weak side to strong side, and just like Kyle said, you would run the same drill through X, right? Let me show that again. Well, let's keep going in the interest of time. Um, years ago, years ago, uh, when I first started coaching um, at McIntosh, before I got fired, everybody knows I got fired. Um, man, Lassiter was really, really strong team. And Lassiter's still a strong team, okay? And, and back in those days, you know, Pete Mandanero was the coach, and Gino Ferraro, the captain personality, um, and I played against him in college, and he's a great guy. Anyway, you know, Lassiter ran a really unique offense. Um, a lot of times they would run their offense instead of top to bottom or bottom to top, they would run their offense laterally, okay? And I thought that had some merit, especially for like one four ones or, you know, when you're playing against the zone and you overload and then you're going to come back weak side in front, whatever it turns out to be. So we kind of came up with a little shooting drill here. You know, we call it the bucket drill. There's a bucket right here. I guess I have the bucket. And all the players are doing here is, notice again, right hand pass, left hand catch, left hand shot, left hand pass, right hand catch, right hand shot. And this is just a, a little way to get a boatload of touches. Imagine how many touches your players would get in just six minutes of running this drill. And again, they're running with the stick coming behind them, throwing and catching. Um, the only thing where this is a little contrary to game emulation is, you know, if I'm running this at Auburn, we really want them to turn their hips and get square to the cage. You know, right here, we're just trying to get loose and get touches. Just a cute little drill called the bucket drill. Again, right hand, left hand. Right hand, left hand, and the pace of the drill is so fast that nobody knows if Billy caught it or he didn't catch it. Everybody with me so far? All right, now this next split, what I want you to do is, this is part of a scrimmage at the same practice. And we were talking to our guys about let's work on the lateral game. Right here. Notice our spacing is pretty good, right? We got good motion, moving everywhere. Coaches are like that. Here he comes. Bingo, bingo. Fucking drop. How many of you play basketball in high school or wrestling? It's no different, is it, than shooting takedowns or doing layups? You know, but, uh, and, and Coach Kyle Hammond is an interesting guy. You know, he's got like, how many of you have been down to see Coach Hammond? She has practices. If you call him, you can go down there any time. Um, he's got 27 plays, right, Rick? Something like that. I mean, he's a lot more analytical than me. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a running guy now. But anyway, his motion is very similar to like a base that we run, only we don't call it a hook, we call it a seat cut. So in this particular case, this guy's going to drive down the field. This is a predetermined drill, OK? We're going to have him roll. This midi here is going to be the fill, right? Or some coaches call it the mirror. So we're going to drive. We're going to pass back, right? This attackman here is going to go where? We have him go through the crease 
and pop, okay? And uh, the coaches that I've worked with, or a lot of guys in this room, you know, we kind of call this a C-cut shooting drill. But I want you to see, this is actually a play that we run in a game. And here's how we turn the play into a shooting drill. Drives, right up here is where you want to see. And again, left hand, left or right hand, right hand, left hand pass, right hand catch, into a right hand shot. We could just as easily set this shooting drill up, like Kyle talked about, with this guy here, instead of a hook, in Kyle's word, using a fade, right? Bang it down here, bang it across, and then into a dodge or whatever. And again, you know, we put our holes in these drills because having them use right hand, left hand, you know, if I can teach them to get 100 touches right hand, left hand with roll dodges and split dodges, I can teach them to redirect the ball pretty easily. Uh, this is probably the biggest point I want to make today. It used to be that coaches spent an inordinate amount of their time in even scenarios. Nobody does that anymore. There are still a couple of coaches that do spend a lot of time in even. Don Starja, as an example. Um, guys that come from the Starja family tree, Lars Tiffany at Brown, as an example. Andy Towers, uh, a little bit, at Dartmouth. All guys that come from that coaching tree. Um, anybody know the name Mike Kressler? I mean, it's coach at Duke, right? Anybody read the book, When the Truth Doesn't Matter? Did you read this book? Anybody here read it? If there's any book you read, that's a book you gotta read. You can't put it down, turn the page so fast. Anyway, so Pressler is a really analytical guy. And when I interviewed him the first time, he had just coached Team USA in the World Games. And I was asking him about the differences between a Duke practice or a Bryant practice and Team USA practice. You know, and, and, and Pressler's going, Number one, like I said, he's really an analytical guy. He said he's got a binder with every goal scored on every team he ever coached or every team he ever coached against going back forever. Right? In that binder, 86%, 86% of every goal occurred in a mini snapshot of transition. So why wouldn't I practice 86% of my non-fundamental skill work in transition scenarios? I mean, when you hear it like that, it makes sense, right? Number one, when the players know that there's always somebody open because they have an extra man, could be three, could be two, could be four, could be three, whatever, they move the ball a lot more because they know somewhere there's an open guy. You with me? Number two, on defense, this is really changed. We used to focus back when Joel flunked out of RIT. Was it RIT you flunked out of? Um, there's just some good coaches in this room, man. Anyway, it used to be that we coached, you know, and, and Rick was a great pole. It used to be we spent a lot of time talking about the slide, right, coach? Now the emphasis is not on the slide as much, but the recovery. Because now you got the slide, the fake slide, the show slide, the partial slide, you know, all those things that Coach Tierney brought to the game. Uh, number one, when you're in transition, it really teaches the players, just like Coach said, <coughs> You know, when, when you go ground ball, pass, pass, or swing, to, uh, when we dodge, we want the next would be a pass or two passes before the money dodge, or what he calls the money dodge. Um, 3D2 is a great way to work on fundamentals, because the field is wide open, players can see, and defensively there's only two places to be, on the ball or back in the hole, so they're constantly learning that recovery aspect. Um, we're seeing college coaches today spend a lot of time in these drills, also crunching the field. Maybe we're going to run this drill to where the players are starting in the back and they're not allowed to go past these cones that are 10 yards in front. Also, you're seeing a lot of college coaches crunch the field, like Bates as an example. It's one of his favorite drills, um, formerly addressed in Al Princeton, you know, where they're going to run a 3v2 on this side but you can't go past this line. So obviously this is mostly right hand, this is mostly left hand, and they toggle this back and forth, you know, super, super quick. <coughs> Not sure what happened to you, sir.
little transition drills. I mean, there's a lot of words that college coaches use. One you hear a lot is something called a swing. And with a swing drill, we're going to have an offensive player, an offensive player, and an offensive player in a very, very basic sense. We're going to put a cone here, cone here, cone here. And then we're going to have defenders. They can come in here. They can come in here. For right now, this is very elementary. When the coach blows a whistle, this guy carries. He has to go around this cone. This guy runs around this cone. This guy runs around this cone. And now we play 3v2. And the reason they have to run around the cone is it gives the poles a chance to come in for reasons I'll share with you in just a second. So in its very basic sense, you know, you see player here. This is that 14 but Player here, player here. And we're just going to play 3v2. Transition drills are so phenomenal because there's so much you can do. If I run my transition drill with the players entering top side, I'm emulating a mini coming down and beating somebody. You with me? But I could also use the same drill technique to emulate the ball being up front and a guy getting backdoor cut. Let's say I put my offensive player back here in a cone. Now I'm going to bring, I mean, you've got to make this different every day. Number one, it emulates the fluid nature of lacrosse games. B, the kids have a blast. So now I'm going to bring a pole in here, and I can bring a pole in here, I can bring it here. Let's say I'm going to have my other line of poles here. I'm going to blow the whistle. This guy's going to carry around. This guy's got to come in. Presumably they're going to cover up here. This guy has to run around a cone, and then he enters the drill. But where's the end of the drill? Back door, right? So I can use this same little swing technique in a 3v2 drill to emulate a player getting beat on ball. I can use it to emulate a player getting beat behind off ball, in front off ball. I mean, all it takes is a little bit of creativity. <coughs> Let me show you how it works. So here at the beginning, this is a different team, but you're watching them go 3v2 top side. This is the basic configuration, right? Run around the cone, poles are coming in from a basic place. Now, it's hard to see, but we've actually moved the offensive line back here. So by carrying in from the back side on this drill, right here, now these two players are being back cut top side. Does that make sense to anybody? Am I just nuts or what? <laughs> but you see what I mean? And, and notice the pace of these drills. Kids just love to practice this fast. Again, whether you're 3v2 to teach it, you know, you do 4v3, 5v4, there's always somebody open. They have to look up and move the ball. It actually discourages players from dodging, right? So we can work on that when we go even. Next thing. Every coach worth his salt designs their offense around minimizing the effectiveness of your slide package. <coughs> you know, if I'm coaching a team, you know, let's say Mercer in their basic set, they're going to crease slide. First thing we're going to do is open set and overload and try and eliminate the slide, right? If they're sliding coma, we're going to drag that guy high. Um, by running transition drills all the time, you teach your kids to communicate and slide naturally or, or intuitively. Um, and again, I, I can tell you, you know, just like Kyle said today, you kind of set it up perfect just what guys do. A couple things and I'll wrap it up. Um, other things that we've learned on the website. How many people think, well, let me, let's play word association or fill in the blank, ready? Practicing rides and clears, you, you shout out the answer. Practicing rides and clears is boring. what? Necessary. Boring. Necessary. I heard boring. Oh, what, are we too nice? Who thinks sucks? <laughs> Practicing rise and clear sucks, eh? I mean, you're always screaming. For some reason, it's always raining, right, when we're doing rise and clears. <laughs> I don't know why. It's like God doesn't like rise and clears. You know, and, and like for me, you know, a lot of you, there's eight or nine guys in this room that their kids play with me. You know, for me, you know, I'm not real big on screaming at kids. Would you agree with that, Joel? But man, I'm great on breaking buckets. You know, I don't, I don't take out my temper on a kid, I take out my temper on a bucket. And, and during rides and clears, I, I end up breaking a lot of buckets. Anyway, so what we see the college coaches doing now is, yeah, you have to work on rides and clears and get them in. 
but you can reinforce those in the middle of your transition drills by running a clear off of every transition drill. That 3v2 drill we were talking about, we're just going to say clear. We could do like uh, Presser does, we could go fast break 4v3. If they score, they get a slow break 4v3, and then we clear. So you see college coaches ending a lot of their drills with clears. Does that make sense? And then, you know, when we interviewed Coach Schillinglaw, uh, Delaware, um, older than me, older than us, you know, uh, this is a cute little drill we got from uh, Coach Schillinglaw, where this is actually a three on two drill. But instead of ending with a clear, it starts with a clear. And again, we're emulating a game scenario. We're back in a fast-paced environment. Goalie yells clear. These two defensemen are going to banana cut out. Right? Now remember, this is a U15 team. We're going to pass to one guy. We can have him roll regardless. We want him now to redirect. Because the only thing worse than practicing rides and clears with a U15 team is what? Practicing redirect passes with a U15 team. So anyway, goalie yells clear. He passes out to one of the poles in a banana cut. He redirects it. This guy bangs it up to the midfield line. Up here, we've got three offensive players. As soon as the ball reaches here, goes to the middle, these three guys come streaking down. Now we're 3v2 off of a clear. Now, those defensemen, where are they now? <coughs> Way outside, right? Now, I'm not saying that emulates a game situation with your team. But yeah, when we get killed on a clear, usually our defensemen are galley west, right? So the cool thing about this drill is that it teaches these guys to communicate and to get the bus back. Once your team gets the hang of this drill, again, you can just add a third defender, and after the ball's redirected, have it bang it here, have it bang it here, put it in the middle line of offense, so tomorrow we're at 4v3 now. Cool, eh? Any questions on that? Um, you know, most teams love to, you know, Kyle said he doesn't condition the kids very often, and we really don't condition our guys very often. Um, in preseason, we will. But this is a simple drill. drill. You know, your college coaches refer to it as a uh, jailbreak or whatever. In this case, we're 5 and 4. Um, the defensive guys have to run in here and touch cone. Now they're going to play defense out. And I have it set up here so we can film it. This is actually that same group in Batavia, Chicago. Um, they've never seen the drill before today. You know, and, and we're going to roll it out. They're going to come flying down. And then we're, and incidentally, in this drill, like a lot of drills that college coaches run, offense and defense are intermixed. Yeah, we want our poles to be able to carry, right? To move it down. Um, so you see, and I think at most colleges, we'll actually run this from the far restraining line all the way down. You know, at the end of practice, we'll run it for 10 minutes. I don't need to run sprints. But I've got the guys carrying and playing at the same time they're being conditioned. Uh, again, I don't have much time, I don't want to get off. But um, in the hours, the, the, the 150 hours, you know, of, of interviews on the site with college coaches, you know, we don't see much even work with college coaches. Uh, if we do, uh, excuse me, we see 6v6 when they're putting in a slide package. We see 6v6 when they're working on scout teams. But if you go to a college practice and you watch those guys practice, a lot of times when they're even, they're 4v4. We can still run our little seat cutter motion offense in a 4v4, right? You saw a film of, of Coach Hannon doing the same thing. And again, it spreads out the field. So players, even younger players, can see the openings. You still dodge, you still double, all those things. But 4v4, uh, I think it would be a lot more done. If you're running 4v4 and you want to keep it interesting or add a transition element, you know, we'll tell the first guy that he's got to drive, he can't pass till he draws. Um, you can lock on uh, adjacent tight. Um, you can double team. You know, even when you're going 4v4 or in your 6v6, Throw in a couple of different elements each day to keep it interesting and, and different for the kids. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, you traditional coaches. You know, ground ball drill to you means what? Three guys lined up, 
Coach rolls the ball to the parking lot. Three guys chase the ball to the parking lot, wailing on each other. One guy picks it up. He's about to throw it back to the coach, who incidentally is standing still 60 yards away, right? As he throws it, Billy hammers him. The ball goes on the ground. The whole episode is repeated. That in and of itself is sad enough, with the exception of we've got 20 of our other players standing behind the coach going like this. <laughs> It doesn't emulate a game situation. It's not fast-paced and fun. It doesn't have a lot of touches. All the rules we talk about aren't there. So you're seeing college coaches get very, very creative with their ground ball drills now. And the other mantra you hear from college coaches all the time is ground ball pass pass, or some say ground ball scoop scoop. So if you're one of my practices, or, or uh, some of your practices, I'm sure, anytime that ball touches the ground, we're yelling pass pass. Ground ball pass pass. Actually, the article I just wrote for last part, you'll see it on Monday, uh, runs a drill similar to this with just attack players. You know, if we can get each of our attack players to get three ground balls a game, we just added 10 mini man ups. Anyway, what you're going to see here is this is a 3v2 drill. This is a U14 team that never saw the drill before. I'm going to roll the ball, these two guys are going to compete. Because most ground balls in a game in real life are really a 1v1 battle, not a 2v1 battle, right? And whoever wins the ball is in the drill. We got two goals and or two defense and three or two other attack or offensive players over here. Whoever wins is in. That's one, two, three offensive players, two defense. You know, we're in 3v2. If you lose the ground ball, what happens to you? You go back in the ground ball line. Obviously, you'll work. <laughs> If you win the ground ball, you get rewarded by being able to play 3v2. Okay. Uh, and again, these are 14 year olds who just had 10 kids. Um, in our coaching clinics, we show a lot of college film, but I thought with this audience, just to prove to you that young teams can run this stuff, you know, I showed you. Even a 1v1, you know, you guys run your 1v1s. A lot of coaches are still running them from the four corners, right? You want a guy to pull the ball outside the box and drive on a player for his one-on-one? -on -one? I mean, is that really what we're looking for? I mean, you heard Coach Hannon talk about it. In this drill, we're going to put two cones. We're going to put a cone over here, a cone over here. We're going to have offensive new player, defensive player. On a whistle, this guy circles this cone. This guy circles this cone. Now we go one-on-one. -on -one. So the offensive player is moving into the ball to catch it before he makes his drive, not pulling it out to the next county. Does that make sense? And again, our defensive player now is coming up. He's got to be under control because he had to go around a cone and come up. I, this cone is always shorter than this cone because we want him to be in position. And again, we're going to toggle this. We're going to toggle this. We're going to go top, bottom, top, bottom to keep the players engaged. Um, if we had a full roster here, or if we were doing this with a 40 man roster, we would have two coaches, two cages, keeping all the players moving. Bingo, they're set up. It happens very quickly. The pace of the practice has to be fast. Bingo, they're set up. Hit a crease, one guy back. This guy's coming just like you would on a crease slide. You see that, coach? Just like a crease slide. Or if you're sliding a cone, I'd have him put the cone over here, have him go around the cone like he's on the cone. And then obviously these situations are, are really important. Um, none of this material is mine. You know, this goes to the NCAA coaches that have blessed us on the site. Um, are you guys getting our newsletter when we post new articles and stuff like that? If you're not, I'll have a sign-up sheet in the back that doesn't, you're not going to pay anything. Just give me your name, your email, and we put out new information twice a month, all free. Um, you'll get a notice saying it's out. I'm happy to send that email out to everybody that's here, because I have everybody's email. You're just a happy guy today, aren't you? Every time I turn around. I'm not even close to you. The happiest Princeton guy I I'm ever met. I'm not close to you. Um, last thing I want to say, kids today are a lot different. They're very intuitive. You know, when me and Hunter played, well, when me and Hunter were younger, were we younger? Okay. You know, you had this undying respect of authority figures. You know, kids don't have it today. And you can fight that till you're green. Or as a coach, 
You can make it so you got to prove yourself every day in practice. It doesn't take long before the kids realize how much time goes into the practice planning. If you're doing 90 minutes, you know, we try and have a minimum of 10 drills. If you're doing a two hour practice, we try and have a minimum of 12 to 13 drills. If it's not there, let it go. And if you're never repeating the same drill two days in a row, pretty soon the kids understand. And then the last thing is, they rather than have them ask you why, when you modify a drill to the emulated game scenario, <coughs> explain to them, this is something we saw in the film, this is something we need to work on, here's a drill. They understand that it's gonna make them better, all right? You got a big responsibility to work with kids, man. Take it seriously. God bless you. I don't know about you guys, but I'm sweating too. Thank you. That's great. Send everybody to go. Black Scotch Blacks. Do you want to go? Huh? Blacks. Do you want to go? First of all. One of them go. Yeah. Go next. Come on up here, Chuck. Come on up. Okay. Well, I'm on here. Is it on the base offs? Yes, sir. Yeah, take a look. This would be a good time to eat in the head or something.